It's day 60 on 100 Days of Code, and today I'm going to teach you the magic of time. That, that's, that's literally just putting the time on the screen. Uh, not time travel. So you may have actually tried this before in one of your programs. We've done a number of things that could have used time up to this point. In fact, we wrote a program where I just got you to stick time in and I didn't talk much about it. And that's because time in itself is not really a supported variable by default in Python. And most programming languages have the same problem with this. Because if you think about what time is, it's actually quite a complicated thing. If I'm talking about a time in the day, then is that in a 24 hour clock? Is that using AM and PM? And it gets worse when we start talking about days and months and years because we have 24 hours in a day, we have leap years, we have leap seconds, and we have a number of bizarre things that happen with the days of the month as well. Not all months are equally spaced. We have 28 day months and 31 day months and 30 day months as well. So with all this craziness around time, it'll come as no surprise why we haven't touched it before. In fact, computers use something called the Unix epoch to count time. Your computer is actually counting the amount of seconds that have elapsed since the 1st of January 1970. And it does some clever mathematics to show you the time in a human readable format. This might sound bizarre, but it's very easy for a computer to count up in seconds from an exact point. In fact, inside your computer, you have a very small battery on your motherboard that keeps your computer counting seconds even when the power is turned off. Now, if computers store time in that way, it must be harder than we think to store time in a human way. Luckily for us, there's a library that we can import called DateTime that does a lot of this for us. So how might we use DateTime? Well, first of all, you need to import it. Importing the DateTime library is nice and easy, and we're going to go from here to build some stuff. And I'm going to start by just turning my expectation of a date into a date. And we do that with my date. That's a variable I'm starting here. We're going to make that equal to DateTime.Date, and then in the brackets, we're going to give it some arguments. I'm going to start with the year. Let's put 2022. I'm going to start with the month, put December. And I'm going to put with the day. Let's go for the 7th. Now, if I print that out just to show you what's happened, when we run it, we get a date. It's in a bit of a strange format, really, isn't it? It's not in any standard format that most humans use. Year, month, and day. Now that's exactly the same way that I was asked to feed those arguments in. And in fact, if you change those arguments around, it is going to shout at you. It wants it in in that particular format. And there are a number of reasons for this. Not least, it stops that continuous argument between Americans and Brits about which order we do the days in. Just to say, I'm a computer scientist. I have no weight in this argument, whether we do day, month, year or month, day, year. But sorry, American colleagues, it seems to me that day, month, year seems a bit more logical. But as a computer programmer, I tend to write dates, or at least think of them, in this format, year, month, day. And the reason for that is that as you move from left to right, the change in size of the element has less importance. So for instance, the change in size of a year has much more importance than the change in size of a month, and it has much more importance than the change in size of a day. And it also allows sorting to happen much easier. But in this format, the computer has actually stored the date in a way that it can understand it. And that means that if I want to store a date and increase it or change it, I should be able to. Start off by putting in something like your date of birth into the computer in a similar way and see what you get. A nicer use of the date time function, which is quite useful in the computer, is to automatically get today's date. So I'm going to say today equals date time dot date dot today. Don't forget those brackets at the end. They should be empty. If we print that out, you'll see exactly the date that I'm writing this because today's date gets printed out. Now that will change every single day and it will keep in sync with the computer. This means now if you're writing a program like a to-do list or you're writing a program that involves any data entry, you could take today's date and automatically add it into your two-dimensional list or your dictionary or whatever you're doing to keep a track of when things were added. Okay, what about if we need to ask the user for a particular date and we wanna translate that? Well. The easiest way to do this is to ask them for the day, the month, and the year as separate values. Let's do that. I'm going to cast them as ints here. And notice I've made those all ints. I can't yet type in a month as a full piece of text. 
then what I'm going to do is use date equals date time dot date. And then I'm going to feed it in the same way as did before. We have a year, we have a month, we have a day. Now what this will do is it will prompt the user for a day first of January 2024. And it will construct that as a date for us. This is a really good way of taking in that input from a user. Pause, take some time to try that out for yourself. A common thing that people want to do is work out the difference between dates. Now that involves learning about the idea of something called a time delta. Delta is a term we use in computer science to mean the difference between something. So the delta in code is the difference between two pieces of code, which is quite handy to know. And of course, the history feature on the top of Replit can allow you to easily move between those code deltas without too much fuss. But a time delta is a difference in time. And that's important because a difference in time, a number of days, a number of months, a number of hours can change from one date to another. For instance, if it's the 28th of February and I add a day on, then I'm going to end up in most cases being on the 1st of March. If it's the 28th of December and I add a day on, I'm going to end up in the 29th of December. Now, date time as a library knows all this. So there's a difference between an actual date and a time delta, which is a gap, a change in the amount of time that's going to happen. We need to tell the computer what time delta we want. In this case, I'm going to call mine difference and it's in date time dot time delta. And we can feed it in there something like a number of days. So I'm trying to work out what the date would be two weeks from today. I have a time delta, a difference of 14 days, and I have a date. I now need to add those things together. So the date will be moved on by 14 days. That is a really important concept. We need to add these together or we can't progress. I'm then going to print out the new date and let's try running it. So it's calculated today's date, which is the 4th of October, added 14 days to it, and it's shown it on the screen as the 18th of October. Well, that's perfect. But can we add a year to it? Let's see. Fantastic. The 4th of October, 2023. A perfect way of incrementing and changing the date on any system. Take some time now to go and try that code for me and see how you get on. Okay, final bit of learning. How do if statements work with dates? Well, Thankfully, as long as you've created a date using the date time library, you can compare dates just like you compare integers, greater than and less than working to say if things are in the future or in the past. In this example here, I've put today's date in automatically and I've added the date of my next vacation, which happens to be the 30th of October. I want to check if my vacation is in the future or in the past. Let's do that. If my holiday is greater than today, I'm going to say coming soon. Elif, my holiday is less than today. I'm going to say, hope you enjoyed it. Otherwise, if it is today, holiday time. And let's run it and see what happens. So it's saying coming soon because the date of my holiday is in the future from my point of view today. So with if statements, it all works exactly as if it was an integer. Dates that are in the future are greater than dates that are in the past. Dates in the past are less than dates in the future. And if dates are identical, we can use the double equals operator to see if they're the same. Take some time and try and build the same program and see if you can get the dates working with if statements. Common problems then. Well, most people get a few problems with dates because they do require the use of a library. And so there's a lot of dots involved. Take this example. Now we're getting an error because it's saying that date time has no attribute today. And that is clearly wrong, isn't it? Because you've just seen me working with that today function. Well, the problem is, is that in the date time library, we're dealing with the date functions. So there's a secondary point at which you need to put a dot in, to separate those out. You'll be shocked to learn that if you're dealing with time, it's going to be date time dot time. I know, right? But dates are fixed. Here's another common problem that people get when they're manually creating dates. If you forget a part of it, for instance, in this case, the month, then it isn't going to build. But that's true of anything, isn't it? This does mean that you can't just say the 5th of September. It doesn't allow you to store that. You need to give it a specific year, which means that sometimes some comparisons require a bit of thinking about in advance. For instance, 
If you need to work out whether something is on the 5th of September, you might need to work out what the current year is and glue that in as part of the process. As ever, I've got a bunch of broken code here. Have a look to see if you can fix it and see if you can get my dates working perfectly. Your challenge today is a nice one. You're gonna create an events countdown timer. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to automatically work out today's date and then ask the user for the name of the event as well as the day, month, and year that it's gonna be happening. I would like you to work out the amount of days until that event happens and display it on the screen. If the event is happening today, I want you to insert some party emoji to make it nice and exciting. If the date's in the past, I want a sad face emoji and tell them how many days ago the event happened. If you need support with this, you can chat in our Discord on the 100 Days of Code channel, you could go to ask.replit.com and post in the 100 Days of Code section, or you could join me live on Replit 101 Code Helpline, where we answer your questions live on YouTube. That's every other Wednesday. When you're done, please share it with us by publishing it in the community, or use the hashtag Replit 100 Days of Code when you share it on social media. So I'm sure that whilst you were building that, you thought, wouldn't it be a nice idea to store all these events in a way that can be saved and loaded later on? Yes, yes, it would. That's a bit of an involved process at the moment. Let me show you some of the secrets of Replit in the next lesson. We're gonna look at Replit DB. Before you say anything, DB stands for database, not David's bald.